And there's another quote about volunteers, that volunteers don't necessarily have the time, they just have the hearts. And as you all know here, we have a team of seven in the amyloidosis group that do all of this work. There's not one of us that could have done this by ourselves. And personally, to the other admins of this team, our group could not have possibly found bigger hearts. So thank you for all that you have done. And I really am going to have to lose weight. I can't tell you how the more progressively unwell I'm going as I'm going through this morning. So at this moment, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce you to Professor Mary Riley, consultant neurologist from Queen's University College, London. She has been a huge feature in our lives for many, many years, and we're absolutely thrilled to have her here with the presentation, ATTR Amyloidosis and the Peripheral Nervous System. So a warm welcome, please, for Professor Riley. Thank you very much, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here. I was very, very pleased to get the invitation. It was one of these invitations, there was absolutely no question. Pandemic, no pandemic, whatever was going on, it was going to happen. So I've been tasked with talking about the peripheral nervous system, but also was asked to give a little bit of a background of how I became involved with amyloidosis, and these are my disclosures. So I'll give a very brief introduction, most of this has been done already, then talk about the common form, that is the Alice 60 of TTR, and then just briefly mention a few challenges. So you've already heard the terms familial amyloid polyneuropathy and TTR amyloidosis. And I just thought it'd be nice to just bed this in. So the disease was originally described in 1952 in Portugal, and that's the one Carlos has referred to. So these were people in their 20s and 30s that had a neuropathy first, early autonomic, and cardiomyopathy came later. And this disease was found to be due to the methionine 30 mutation. And this is spread all around the world and is the commonest type. We're particularly common in Brazil, which is why it's relevant to the Brazilian population in Ireland, particularly common in Sweden and Japan, and obviously has been seen in many other countries. But we now know that TTR amyloidosis is a systemic disease, and that's actually critical in terms of therapy. And it clearly usually involves the peripheral nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, the heart, but also connective tissue giving you carpal tunnel syndrome and spinal stenosis. So it's a systemic disease, and that is why we don't call it familial amyloid polyneuropathy anymore. And you've seen this slide. There are multiple different <coughs> mutations or variations. There's, you know, we put up 130. I had, so one slide said 140. It changes so often, none of us can quite keep up with it. But the one that we're talking about today mainly is 3 Nina 60. And patients maybe get confused because they see sometimes people are calling it 80 and sometimes calling it 60. So we all call it 60, but the genetic reports, for all kinds of reasons I won't go into, have added another 20. So everything is 20 more than it used to be, and we won't say why, except it's confusion. And it used to be, if you looked 10 years ago, you can see that this was thought to cause a cardiomyopathy and nothing else, where it quite clearly causes a neuropathy and cardiomyopathy. And this is a paper that we've been involved in internationally this year. And I think where it is now is about right. It's very unusual not to have the cardiomyopathy at some stage. But the neuropathy is nearly always there, but not quite as commonly presenting as the cardiomyopathy, at least from our work to date. But it is both cardiomyopathy and neuropathy. And anybody that thinks that it's just cardiomyopathy will miss a critical part of the disease. And if we talk about it, we go back, we'd love to talk from Sinead on the history earlier today, but this was the seminal paper from Hugh Staunton, and actually something just dawned on me last night. So Hugh Staunton was a neurologist in Beaumont from Castlebarra Mayo. I'm from Belmulleton Mayo. Mark Coyne is from Castlebarra Mayo, and one of the other major neurologists working in this in, in um, Scotland, Katie Brennan, is from Mayo. So there's something about Mayo and this disease in neurologists, which is pretty in incredible. Now, what he did is he described the original collection of families. And because he had done his PhD in Germany, he got the biopsies typed there to show it was TTR. Now, he didn't know the variation, that is the mutation. And you all know about the speculation, was it the Spanish Armada? Were there genes dropped in 
and did they stay around? And that was, you know, it was a lovely second last line in a paper. Everyone likes to have a kind of a, a punchy second last line. But there was a very famous neurogeneticist in Queen's Square, where I now work, called Anita Harding, who sadly died at the age of 43, shortly after I started working with her. And she really had set up the first neurogenetic service in the UK. And Hugh contacted her, and one of the early patients, they showed that it was a different mutation from the Portuguese, that is the Alice 60 mutation. Now, you are right when you saw earlier that this was actually described at the same time as the families in Donegal were described. It was described in Appalachian kindred. And I met Benson for the first time in 1992 when we started our argument. I said, it's an Irish amyloid. And he said, it's Appalachian. That was a long time ago. We've won, of course. And basically, this was the original family. And if you look right back up, the original founder in this family was from Ireland. And he traced back the records to Ellis Island, and she'd come through Derry at the time of the famine in the mid-1840s. So that we know then that the mutation arose in Donegal before that. Now we tried to speculate how much before that, but it was before that. And around this time, I began to get letters from Sydney, from America quite a lot, none from Scotland at this stage. So this was fortuitous for me. So I was working in Dublin at the time. I trained in Dublin. Actually, Tony DeLapp, who's a GP here, was in the same class as me. And um, I was doing my register jobs with a really great urologist called Michael Hutchinson, who had trained in Queen's Square. So Anita decided we needed to look into the Donegal amyloid in more detail, really to see, do all people have the same mutation, describe the disease in more detail, try to get an idea how common it was. So I was very lucky I got the job, but I think the reason I got the job is, I can't show you because I can't, but I come from the Mullet, Bell Mullet, which is on the peninsula. You think you're far west here, you're not even getting there. So right out at the end. And I come from a Gaelic speaking area, and it is true that up till I was age 12 in school, we did everything through Irish. But I have to say I'd be challenged to speak much now. And actually, I'm sure part of the reason I was picked was because I could go to Donegal, but in my whole time in Donegal, there was only one person I met that spoke nothing but Irish. He was in his 90s, and we couldn't speak at all. My Irish was completely useless, the different accents of it. So I got a job with Anita Harding, and really to spend a couple of years in the laboratory, mostly working out the genetics, but part of that was spending approximately six weeks in total in Donegal, three two-week periods. And that was an incredible experience, actually. So I had the original family trees from Staunton, and I contacted a member of each family who were incredibly generous at contacting other members and arranged me for to personally visit every member of the family that was available. I also looked at 200 people in the population randomly over a certain age, examined them all neurologically, and took bloods. And I wanted to particularly mentor Dr. Brian Callaghan and Dr. Lean Bannon, who I think is here, who were the two consultant physicians at the time in Letter Kenny, you know, who let me sit, gave me a room in their clinic, and let me ask all the patients coming to their clinics, could I see them about research, which was phenomenally generous. Also, there was multiple GPs, and I particularly wanted to mention Jimmy Brogan and Eamon Ralph, who were the two initial GPs I worked with again, who gave me space and time to see everyone. And um, I used to come here, and actually, it was quite funny for the first couple of days when I came. Anyone that was around in the early 1990s probably remember what was happening with tax. There was tax investigations left, right, and center. And there was a rumor there was a female tax inspector coming to Donegal. <laughs> and I would go into pubs and houses and ask directions to someone's house. And for the first few days, nothing happened. And actually, it was Eamon Ralph that helped the rumor disappear that I was a tax inspector. But people were incredibly generous and nice to me. And you know, having someone coming, talking about a genetic disease that had only been described a few years earlier, and coming into the families when you know, it was an untreatable disease, it was actually very difficult. And I met someone this morning that told me they had my consent form still at home from 30 years ago. So we published from that a lot of work on the families. We, we described the inheritance, we described the picture that is the phenotype, and we found that about one in 200 in the population carry the mutation. Of course, you couldn't say that properly unless you looked at the whole population, so that was from looking at 200. And we traced the families, and I think it's interesting to say that every single family had relatives in Scotland, and there was no cases in Scotland at that stage. It hadn't been described, so basically it was being missed. Otherwise, it was almost all US relatives and some Australian. Very few people, it's interesting, the south of Ireland, nobody seemed to go from Donegal to the south of Ireland. It was like nobody goes there. It was either away or stay. And, it's, and of course, there was many in Northern Ireland. 
And a few things happened. Well, I wrote my MD thesis from then, and this gave me a lifelong research interest in inherited neuropathies, which I've spent my career doing. But I also realized that this was an absolutely devastating disease. And actually, the patient that really brought that home to me was a relative of someone here that lived in London, whom I visited in the last few months of his life, where he was bedbound with supine hypertension. That is, as he lay down, his blood pressure went up. Every time he sat up, his blood pressure dropped. He had constant diarrhea. He was in heart failure, and he was in pain from the neuropathy. And I have this picture of him. I actually saw his son not so long ago, really in my face, that this was a really serious illness. And it is a progressive illness, and at that stage, there was no treatment for it. And it was you know, a devastating illness at the time. And in the UK, we do see a lot of this. So this is a paper from our group in, with, together with the NAC in 2015, where about 50% of all of the mutations, of which there was about 44, were the Alice 60. So immigration, particularly Scotland, but Liverpool and many other places in the UK. And I think what's striking in the UK, and Carlos alluded to this, a lot of the families immigrated a long time ago. That is, you know, 1850, 60, 70. And they don't know they're from Donegal. And they're turning up as patients who don't know about the family history. So it's pretty common in the UK to have patients that really don't know that they have a risk of this. And that's a problem in the UK. And even with the more recent, the wild type TTR and the one we've heard about, the Isoleucine 1 to 2 in Afro-Caribbeans and Americans, Afro-Americans, it's still very common, the TTR out of 60. And what is different from it. So the classic Portuguese one, the onset is younger, 20 and 30s. They usually start with a painful neuropathy, burning, tingling pain. It then gradually evolves to cause numbness, gradual weakness, starting in your legs and moving up, autonomic involvement, which I'll come back to, and then motor involvement later. But if you look at the Irish amyloid, on average, it's later. Now, I think when I described this 30 years ago now, 61, I think you know patients were not being diagnosed in time, and it probably is, depending on what we mean by onset, in the 50s. I think that's the first thing to say. Autonomic involvement can be very serious, and Sinead Murphy will talk about that. That is particularly the diarrhea, constipation, the blood pressure drop, the postural hypertension is incredibly difficult for patients, urinary, bowel, and sexual dysfunction. The cardiac involvement I won't touch, because many people are going to talk about it, but that's very common. And for some reason, this mutation never causes the eye problems that we see with other mutations. And understanding that is very difficult. And we did say there was reduced penetrance. And the word penetrance means the chances of you getting the disease if you have the mutation. Now, one of the problems is if an average age of onset was 60s, some people will die of other illnesses. So getting the true prevalence is more difficult. And I suspect if everyone lived to 100, they may or may not. But I have seen patients in their late 80s and 90s with no disease who carry the mutation. All women. It does seem to be women have a little bit less penetrant than men. And just a few things to point that in the, the LS60 patients, about just over, just 47% present with heart and about 41% with neuropathy. Now, there are rare other presentations. And a few things here. Carpal tunnel syndrome, it was 70%. And that was just from a retrospective study. I can't remember the last patient I saw that didn't have it, bilateral carpal tunnel. I suspect if we looked carefully, it's always there. The second thing is only 47% of the Alice 60 have pain as the first symptom. So if you're looking for pain to tell you they have the disease, you will miss it in over 50% of the people because most people present with numbness. And I find that with later mutations in TTR in any case. So I think there are differences in the TTR Alice 60 that people need to remember. You do see atypical presentations with all types. So that's what I mean by length dependent. It starts in your feet, most wasting is distally, and then it gradually moves up to your knees and then your hands. But this is someone with Alice 60 who presented with wasting and weakness of his thighs. So you can get different presentations. Again, you miss it if you think just in the box. And in terms of how it causes the disease, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just to make a few general comments. So going back to basic genetics. So we all have a code, which is called our DNA, in every cell in our body. The DNA gets transcribed to a single strand of messenger RNA, which gets translated to the protein. So the TTR is the protein for which people have a genetic code for TTR. And it's when there's a mutation in that genetic code that it makes the protein not fold properly. Oops. And 
Of course, I have found the last few years one of the unexpected benefits of COVID is all patients understand the genetic immunological lingo. I talk about messenger RNA and nobody has any problem understanding what I'm talking about compared to three years ago. So the lingo is actually much easier now. And the thing to remember about TTR, you've been told, 85% is produced in the liver. So this transcription and translation into the protein happens in the liver. So this TTR protein is not in the heart normally. It's not in the nerve normally. So we really don't have to worry how it causes the disease. We just have to stop it getting there. That's the most important thing to do. So when it's then in the blood, it's in a folded fashion, which tends to misfold if there's a mutation to form amyloid fibers, which for some reason particularly like the nerves and the heart. And I'm not going to talk about the treatment because Julian is, but all of the treatments that aim at reducing the production of the protein hit you at the DNA and the mRNA level to prevent the protein being made. So that's the basic concept of genetic therapies and genetic silencing therapies. And it is an axonal neuropathy, and this really is something I want to get across to the clinicians here. So we remember from our anatomy, nerves, and this is a nerve, a normal sura nerve. It used to be, if you wanted to be a peripheral nerve specialist, you had to give a sample of your nerve. Luckily, by my stage, you only gave a sample of your skin for nerve biopsies. So all of my older colleagues had nerve biopsies done. It's pretty painful if you have a normal nerve. And if you look at it in closer, each of those white bits are an axon, and they're surrounded by this dark blue material, which is myelin. So the disease is in the axon, so it's an axonal neuropathy. So that's what a normal nerve looks like, that's when there's amyloid in it. So that pink stuff is amyloid in the nerve. The problem is, the amyloid can stop the conduction. And if you've heard a condition called chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, so there is a condition, a serious condition of nerves, which is commonly misdiagnosed, and those patients are put on very serious immunosuppressive treatments. And you think this is rare stuff I'm saying. 2007, 20% of people with TTR amyloid were diagnosed as this condition. 2017, it's still 20%. So it's the biggest misdiagnosis still out there. So for anyone, GPs here, that have a patient with this condition, CIDP, that doesn't seem to be responding to therapy, this needs to be thought of, TTR. Now, what do I do in terms of diagnosis? Well, we see people in two particular instances at the moment. The neuropathy is their very first presentation, so we're seeing them because they have a neuropathy. They may have a family history, or we may be seeing a new patient. Or they've been to the amyloid center, Julian has found a cardiomyopathy, and he sends them to me to see the neuropathy. And of course, for a lot of the treatments, all the gene silencing, we need to find the neuropathy. So there's no pressure on me to find the neuropathy in this. And just to make the point about the diagnosis, so every one of us that are clinicians, when we went to medical school, we were taught, never miss the treatable. So if it was a really rare disease and wasn't treatable, yeah, you worried about it. But if it wasn't treatable, there was no harm done. But TTR amyloidosis is now a treatable disease, so it's a never miss diagnosis. This cannot be missed. This cannot be missed, and that's one of the things we have to get across. This is completely changed because it cannot be missed. But as was said earlier, you will miss it unless you have a clinical suspicion. And in this paper that's been referred to earlier today, no, sorry, this is the one we, we've, a different paper that we've published this year, we were talking about the red flags. So in my practice, I would say that the red flags, neuropathy with autonomic, if someone hasn't diabetes, is amyloid to proven otherwise. There are different forms of amyloid. There isn't a differential in most things. Bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome is a really, yes, you can get it from other reasons, and unilateral, one hand carpal tunnel is very common. But bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome is a major red flag. And in a neuropathy clinic, if someone turns up with a pacemaker, that's a big red flag. Of course, ethnic background is something you have to think about with different mutations. And if someone turns up in a clinic in England with relatives from Donegal, I mean, you know, you think of this before you even think of anything else. But there are red flags. And in terms of, this has been referred to by Mark earlier, that we have this consensus document about diagnosis across the UK and Ireland to have complete equity for patients to have access to the same, that we all have exactly the same standards. And again, the common mutations you've heard about earlier. And it was pointed out that compared to cardiomyopathy, if neuropathy, we go for genetic testing much earlier. So as soon as we confirm it, we do genetic testing. And how do we confirm it? we do a history, examination, and nerve conduction studies. So we don't do anything else after that, we go straight to genetic testing. And the genetic testing can be done by a single gene test or multiple genes, and we would go for a single gene test in this scenario. So that's really important. And people ask me, 
do I do it in every patient at the moment? And I would say I do it in every patient that's an undiagnosed neuropathy. It's something we do in every patient with an undiagnosed neuropathy. We just don't wait around for it. But in some patients, they come with symptoms, particularly when they've been found to have cardiac amyloid, and they come with a little bit of tingling, very little, and we have normal examination and normal nerve conduction studies. So in those patients, we do a skin biopsy now. And the skin biopsy finds those little tiny pain nerves in your skin, and we can count them and stain for amyloid. And this paper that came out this year is a critical paper. It's come from France, and it looked at all of their patients. It's a different mutation. There was about 76% of them that had an abnormal skin biopsy. But if you look far over there, they took patients who had no symptoms but carried the gene. And in those, as you can see, 31% had an abnormal amyloid deposition skin. So I think within the next few years, we'll be doing skin biopsies in someone that's mutation positive to see if that's the first sign of neuropathy. So I introduced this into my practice in um, 2021 regularly. That's a skin biopsy just to show the different types. And the first 25 patients since June 2021, 24% are positive. And these are people who had normal nerve conductions, but they had symptoms. And 24%, and they're now all in gene science and earlier. So this is changing the way we practice. And this, to me, should be normal standard of care as soon as it can be everywhere else. We still do nerve biopsies occasionally. So sometimes we're doing it in a patient, and it's a bit of a surprise diagnosis. But sometimes they're really complex patients who have multiple causes of a neuropathy possible. They may have diabetes. They may have other causes. They may have you know, a myeloma. They may have other things. And we absolutely have to get the biopsy. So sometimes we still need to do serial nerve. And we do do muscle biopsy as well if we do that. And I won't go into what you do with the biopsy. There's no point in doing a biopsy unless you have the expertise, pathology-wise, to read the biopsies. And it's the Congo red staining, which is the classical stain, is a little tricky. So you do need to do it. And I would say it's a shame in the UK, I'm sure it's the same in Ireland, but I don't know this, it could be much better, but you know, this gets missed, this diagnosis among the gastroenterologists. And all of those biopsies that are done in the UK for bowel, for stomach, they don't stain for amyloid ever. It's not a routine skin in the UK anywhere, which to me is extraordinary. Now, once you have a positive genetic test, if you have a neuropathy, we nowadays don't always do a tissue biopsy. And this was the, what you've seen earlier, but to simplify it, if you come from a family that has known to have a particular mutation, if you carry the gene, and if we diagnose a neuropathy, and if your scan, that is the scan you've done by the cardiologist, is called positive, we don't do a biopsy now. That is enough to make a diagnosis. So not everyone needs a biopsy now. We, it's individualized depending on the circumstances. For the neurologists, GPs, and clinicians out there, one thing to say is don't miss spinal stenosis. So basically, this is the first patient I saw with this. So a patient sent to me from Julian, query neuropathy, tingling in the feet, sounded like a neuropathy, but when we saw them and took the history, it was clearly spinal stenosis. And you can see on the scan the spinal stenosis, and we biopsied it when they were operated on in the ligamentum flavum, they have TTR. And we now know that this is the commonest cause of spinal stenosis, wild type TTR. If you biopsy people that have spinal stenosis, this is the cause of it. So very common. So we've looked at our series, and we have actually seen it with all types, including at Alice 60. So this is, it's like having it in your flexor retinaculum causing carpal tunnel syndrome. You get it in your ligamentum flavor, and you get spinal stenosis. So when we see people, we have to be careful to differentiate between neuropathy and spinal stenosis, because the lower limb symptoms are the same. The clue is usually severe back pain brought on by walking, or neurological symptoms brought on by walking and relieved by five minutes rest. And just to remind me, even though this is a treatable disease and Julian will go to all these treatments, we also have to manage symptoms. And neuropathic pain can be very troublesome, and we use the same type of agents we use generally for neuropathic pain. I mean, I find pregabalin quite good, lidocaine patches occasionally, opiates less good, but they do work as well and as poorly as they do for other neuropathic pain. Sensory complications, and I'm going to show a few pictures here, this is what we're trying to prevent. Foot care is incredibly important. You have to prevent ulcers, osteomyelitis, amputations. So if you don't look after your feet with a sensory neuropathy, this is what happens. And weakness is a complex issue. So very commonly, patients will say, I feel weak. And then you look at them, and it's complex. Yes, a neuropathy will make you weak. But if you've got bad cardiac disease, and you're breathless, every time you walk or go up the stairs, you'll feel weak. And postural hypertension, where your blood pressure drops, can make you feel very fatigued. So weakness and fatigue are very common 
and very multifactorial. And you have to keep that into mind when treating it. But of course, there's simple things you can do for the neuropathy, like the right aids, like the right stick wheelchairs. And you know, people, in, you know, people sometimes when they have this disease quite badly wouldn't like to use a wheelchair. And to be fair, men more than women. They don't like giving in to the wheelchair. But actually, it has revolutionized some people's lives because it's let them get out and about and live a normal life. So there was a resistance to people using wheelchairs, which was understandable. People asked to they exercise. And again, it's safe if you have a neuropathy, but it has to be thought about in the context of the rest of your diseases. Is your heart up to exercise? Can you do it? And we would recommend you doing as much and appropriate exercise as you can, because keeping generally fit is good. So I always say, keep the good muscles fit. I mean, if you sit in bed for three weeks, you're pretty weak, your thighs, normal people, if you fracture your leg, so you've got to work at it within what's ever right for you. Now, there are multiple challenges, and I think one of them I wanted just to mention is, and this has come out, so when I was training as a medical student, there were general physicians and some very good ones in Letterkenny who managed everything. And we've all got more and more and more subspecialized, and I'm almost, I almost do just hereditary neuropathy, not quite, I do neuropathy, but I'm pretty specialized. And these patients do not have specialized illnesses. The patients have illness that's covering everything. And one of the problems is you go to your cardiologist for one bit, you go to your neurologist for the other bit, you go this here and everywhere. And if you have a problem with fluid, so you have cardiac failure, you're being told to cut, to, 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 to cut your fluids down. Then the autonomic neuropathy people, because your postural hypertension, take more fluid. Take, to do this with salt. Then you have diarrhea, so you're losing all the fluid anyways. And you, know, you don't want to drink or eat before you go out. Managing that is incredibly difficult. So there has to be someone orchestrating this. Now, sometimes there's a brilliant GP who's really good at managing this. Sometimes geriatricians do it. Sometimes actually palliative care in some patients who are more severely affected. But as patients hopefully will have much less disease, we have to get better at managing this. And this is an issue that has to be dealt with locally. And Julie and I have discussed this, how we do it in the UK. But I think it is something I find patients find that nobody is orchestrating, nobody's the conductor of their disease in trying to manage it. And often it's the patient themselves. The other thing is we have lots of new treatments and we have to work out not only how we give these, but what are we going to do for the next 20, 30, 40 years? We have to monitor people. We have to work out which treatments are working for who and if not, why not and change them. So whatever funding you're all organising, we have to fund proper follow-up. If we don't do that, we'll never learn, and patients will not get as good a service as they could. And monitoring the response to treatment, again, I won't dwell in this, dwell in it, but it's very important. Now, we've all talked about optimising early diagnosis, and I think that is critical. And as I said, we probably will change what we're doing to do stuff in people when it's pre-symptomatic. And we look at patients, we look at at-risk relatives, and, you know, for gene silencing, you need to have neuropathy. And I know I'm waiting for the question, and I'm going to preempt it. Somebody's going to say... Why aren't you treating us when we have carpal tunnel syndrome? So carpal tunnel syndrome is due to the amyloid in the tendons pressing on the nerve. It's not a neuropathy. So it's not allowed as a sign of neuropathy. But if we can show it always translates to a neuropathy or to a cardiomyopathy, we might be allowed to try treatment. But with ALICE 60, the average length of time from the carpal tunnel syndrome to the neuropathy is seven years, and some people are 13 years. So say you get carpal tunnel syndrome at 62, do you want to be on some treatment that you might get a disease in your 70s? But if you got it in your 40s or your 50s, you might. So that's still being looked at. And I would say in the future, we'd probably be doing serial skin biopsies after your carpal tunnel to pick up the neuropathy as soon as it might be there. And I've mentioned the skin biopsies, and we've mentioned this key summary points that Mark said earlier about who was being screened. And we've also thought about, can we pick up a neuropathy in any other way? So we've worked on a different group of inherited diseases, neuropathies, and we found what's called neurofilament light chain. It's a marker in the blood of a neuropathy. And we published for the first time in 2019 that it's elevated in all patients with amyloid neuropathy. And then Annihilin were able to look back at their patisserin trial and show it was responsive to treatment. And we and others are now looking to say, can that be measured in the blood before you have any symptoms? Because if that goes up, it's telling us you're getting a neuropathy. We just can't see it yet. So we're looking to pull back the diagnosis with skin biopsies, with neurofilament light chain testing and others the whole time. And there's a lot of international discussion about when you can make the diagnosis, but that is evolving. And that is why for the ALICE 60, we've got to continue working together between the UK and Ireland to have all of the patients being followed up in the same way, otherwise we will never learn. I won't go into the various ways we should monitor the treatments, but I did want to very briefly mention one thing, because people ask about this. 
Those among the audience that are very clued in will have seen 85% of the gene is produced in the liver. 15% isn't. And that's produced in the retina in the eye, and with the ALICE 60, that doesn't seem to be a problem. But some is produced in the brain, that is the chorite plexus. And with the ALICE 60 patients, I have never seen anyone with brain disease, okay, just to reassure people. But with other forms of TTR amyloid, we have seen people present with brain disease, that is, with quite a lot of complex diseases, with strokes, with dementia, with hydrocephalus, etc. Now, what we do know from the Portuguese patients that used to have liver transplants, and if you think about it, a liver transplant is like a surgical gene silencing. You take out the liver that's producing the abnormal. So if we see what's happened to those patients, we can predict what might happen in 10, 15 years' time on people on gene silencing. And what has happened, after about 10 years, people begin to get some problems with slight little attacks, a bit like migraine and stroke-like elements, and they do begin to get amyloid in the brain, but it's many, many years later. We don't know if it'll happen with all mutations, and it is 10 to 15 years later, but at the moment, none of the drugs that we give or any of the science and therapies cross the blood-brain barrier. So we are all working behind the scenes at monitoring that to develop something that we can treat that with. So that's what I mean is by monitoring is very important. But as I said, it's less of a problem with the ALIS-60 than I think it is with some of the other mutations. And we've never seen it to date with the ALIS-60, although we have seen it from Ireland with a different mutation. But of course, with challenges, this is phenomenal opportunity. I mean, you know, the opportunities are huge. The challenges are there. We'll all deal with them. That's what we do. And it is a treatable condition. I think to, for me personally, I just wanted to finish saying, so I got involved in this in 91. So I got a great opportunity to do research in this disease. And from someone that was told the Spanish Armada brought it in, to coming to Donegal and actually having the most amazing experience. And it was terrifying coming, to be fair, to be honest. It was absolutely terrifying coming because, you know, you're walking into people's houses, you're meeting GPs, physicians, you know, asking everyone to help you, everyone to do stuff for you, um, knowing that it was an untreatable disease, you had nothing to give back at that stage. But I would never have anticipated we'd have gene science. And I thought we might get a therapy, but like all of us working in inherited diseases, what we thought would happen is we'd work out how the protein that was abnormal caused the disease, and that's a little bit how tofamidus and teflunazole have come on it, and then work out how to treat it. But I never envisaged that we could actually go into a cell and change the DNA, which we now can do for multiple diseases. For me, this has been an amazing experience. And for me personally, and I deal with a lot of inherited neuropathies, to see it happening with TTR amyloidosis, the first disease and the one that's closest to my heart, is absolutely incredible. And finally, I just want to thank my own current group and the ones highlighted in bold are the ones that work on TTR and obviously all of my funders. And I wanted to finish by, I came to Donegal between 91 and 93. I'm from Mayo and go back regularly. And I've never been back to this part of Donegal since, which is terrible. And I, it's phenomenal for me to have the opportunity just to thank the patients, the families, and physicians in Donegal. And I remember, and I think it was Liam Bannon that said this to me or way back, you know, I remember coming to families and going into houses, and some of the families hadn't realized this was genetic. And it was upsetting, a research person coming in, discussing this, and I'm sure people were upset by it, but they, you know, nobody wants to think about a disease that's untreatable. And families particularly don't want to really think about it because everyone thinks about their children. But people were incredibly generous because they all thought, if I can do something to help the future, and those families that did help me, I hope it did contribute to understanding the disease better for the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor O'Reilly. That closes out the morning session. We shall break now for lunch, and if we're back in our seats for round about two o'clock, that would be absolutely fabulous. So see you for the afternoon session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.